In a casting show, Tom Franz conquered Israeli hearts with his cuisine. Yeah. The German became Israel's master chef. Now he's taking us on a culinary expedition. Today, we're traveling with Tom Franz from Galilee to Tel Aviv. Akko, thousands of years old and the capital of the Crusaders, was formerly the Holy Land's major port. Buri Buri lives here. He's the country's most famous chef for fish dishes. I've lived near the water since I was born. My parents' house, and where I live today, it's right on the sea. When I open the window, there's the sea, and when everyone else was in school, I went to the sea. The sea is my life. Buri Buri is not your real name. No. How did you get this name? Buri is a mullet fish. And because I spent many years more submerged in water than outside of the water and brought a lot of mullet fish home, my nickname was Buri Buri. We're speaking German as if it was nothing special, but we're out at sea, outside of Akko in Israel. Why do you speak German so well? My mother's aunt came from Germany after the war and she wasn't able to learn Hebrew. And when I was young, she would read Winnie the Pooh and Lottie and Lisa to me. So I had to learn. Today, Akko is a World Heritage Site. It still has a little fishing port. That's the mullet fish puri. The man with the prophet's beard is as legendary as his restaurant. Uri combines flavors from all over the world. Dried watermelon with goat's cream cheese. Lettuce from Galilee with figs and citrus fruit. Fish carpaccio with lime and capers. Squid and well-wrapped salmon fillet. Served with wasabi ice cream. I always tell people, salmon without wasabi ice cream is like a kiss without moustache. <laughs> Akko is Israel's most oriental city. Although the historic old town is a magnet for tourists, many of the young Arab Israelis are unemployed. What people lack most in order to find themselves is a feeling of success, right? Yeah. No one asked them what it was like in school. They never got good grades and were never able to show what they did to no one. So what I do is, young people who get kicked out of school, they're usually 15, 16, I take them to work with me and teach them kitchen work. Kitchen work is an instant success for most people because when they come into the kitchen and take tomato, cucumber, onion and a bit of olive oil, lemon and lettuce on top and they feel like they've never had salad like this before. And others will eat the salad and are happy. They say thank you, that was nice. This feeling gives you adrenaline and makes you addicted. And this success will bring people back to the kitchen, and today we have four of them. 
vier von denen. His social commitment is not by chance. Buri himself attended the School of Life, lived in a commune, and worked as a bomb disposal expert before he began to work as a self-taught chef. A wonderful fresh fish, properly cooked and correctly seasoned. Wonderful. We're having a fish called Antias. This fish is kosher. All fish with scales and fins are kosher. This is what the Bible's Old Testament says. All other forms of seafood without scales and fins are not pure, not kosher. So all crustaceans, all shellfish are a no, as well as fish without scales like eels. But all fish with scales are kosher and end up on the plate and can be made into wonderful dishes. A few meters further away is Uri's lifetime achievement. He turned the ruin of an Ottoman palace into a hotel. How many floors does it have? Four? No, it has two floors. Two floors, but each floor is... Six meters in height, yes. Each layer of the Effendi Hotel tells you about history. Byzantine, Islamic, Ottoman. Craftsmen took ten years to restore it. Is this hotel some kind of lifelong dream you've fulfilled yourself? I don't know. I don't dream. I do stuff. I never dreamed I'd become a chef and run a restaurant. It just happened, like my life rules. Some people say you should live every day as if it were your last of your life. I say this is stupid to live in constant panic and to think short term and so on. I say you should live as if you have another 200 years to live. Forty kilometers down the road, in the green north of Israel, near the Lebanese border, is where one of the great innovators of Israeli cuisine lives. Eris Komorovsky fulfilled one of his dreams when he built a house in the middle of a vegetable garden in Galilee. Okay, eggplants. Take some eggplants. Oh, eggplant. We'll do, do, we'll do some eggplants. Eggplant. So many eggplants. The Israeli cuisine is very diverse because it's uh, constructed from many, many, many culinary cultures. We came from uh, Poland and we came from uh, Russia and we came from uh, Morocco and we came from uh, Germany. <laughs> we came from uh, Tunisia and we came from uh, wherever. Uh, yeah, it's a melting pot of, uh, it's a culinary melting pot, like California in many ways. This Israeli cuisine has gone through a revolution. You are said to be one of the, you know, people that moved this revolution. What happened? The 80s, the French culinary heritage was like the Catholic pop. You know, nobody yeah. could... Uh, High French cuisine. Uh, only French was considered to be good uh, cooking. Only French. Omelette was considered to be the best. And the rise of the ethnic cuisines, fast roasting or thiering, uh, really changed immensely the, our approach to Israeli cuisine. And we allow ourselves to believe that good couscous is not uh, less culinary or gastronomic than a flambe of quelquechose. As is often the case, the art should be simple. Erez is roasting an aubergine on an open fire. It's a classic dish of Israeli cuisine. For that use, you use the big one, the fat yeah, one, the, the plump the... ones. Four minutes on each side. And now the, uh, the dish is very simple. Look how white it is. Wonderful. Like snow white. You take some salt and lemon juice. 
and you take some pickled lemons, uh, crushing it with garlic. Crush it, crush it for me, crush it for me. And I'll add some uh, tarragon leaf. Estragon. Estragon, tarragon. And a little olive oil now. Pour it into it, on, on top of the eggplant. Be generous, life will be generous with you. <laughs> uh -huh. And now you taste it with yogurt. So simple, so good. Oh. This is really cuisine, you know. Lemon juice, garlic, pickled lemons, yogurt, olive oil. Mm. Irez loves the craftsmanship of cooking, but not so much the rules White which wine. could restrict him. He has a particular problem with religious regulations. Mm. Good, huh? Wonderful. You know, you are kosher and I'm not. I think Israeli cuisine is not kosher. I think uh, the Israeli cuisine in Tel Aviv, for example, is not kosher at all. You know, in, 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 in Acre, you know, you, you eat uh, shrimp with olive oil and yogurt and then garlic. It's good, it's good. I don't miss anything. And for me, it's, I mean, it's, it's really a joy of kosher. But for me, cooking is freedom. I cannot imagine myself to put uh, restrictions I cook whatever I want, with whatever I want, with whatever spice, with what, whenever I want. Not to use milk and meat, not to use pork, not to use... Oh, la la, it's well, horrible. I grew up on all these things, <laughs> and I have no problem not to use it today. I'm fine with it. <laughs> I'm a liberal. <laughs> Tel Aviv is the capital of liberality. This is Tom France's home too. The faces of this dynamic Mediterranean metropolis are as varied as its cuisine. Hardly any dish expresses the mix of cultures more aptly than the shakshuka. The best one is made by Dr. Shakshuka, the king of street food. Shakshuka is a breakfast classic, and the man whose actual name is Bino Gamso didn't get his doctor's title for nothing. More, that's garlic. That's good. Shakshuka is originally from somewhere in northern Africa, maybe from Libya or maybe Tunisia, we're not sure. But the truth is, somewhere between Morocco and Egypt. Today it's one of Israel's signature dishes and most people will eat shakshuka at least once a week because they yearn for it and look forward to it. Shakshuka sounds spicy, and it is. Sweet paprika. I think this one packs a punch and I'm about to burn my mouth. <laughs> and now you have to mix it all. Can you see the color? Even King Solomon will eat this. And then you poach eggs in this sauce. That's it. It's simply poached eggs, North African style. It's called shakshuka, which means it's a mix, a mishmash, and it tastes really good. You have to eat it with fresh bread, which you take in your hand and dip into the sauce. You don't actually need a knife, fork or spoon, you just need a piece of bread and the pan. You eat it straight from the pan. The kitchen door provides perfect access to the people in this country. Jewish immigrants brought their traditions to Israel from all over the world. Mm. That's good. Dr. Shakshuka is in the far south of Tel Aviv, in the center of the old town of Jaffa, where you can still feel the charm of the Orient. The ancient port is the key to Tel Aviv's history. 
When the Arab town became too full a hundred years ago, the Jews moved to the north of the town and founded Tel Aviv. Today, Jaffa is a city district. Chaim Cohen, the father of the top chefs, grew up in the old city. Tom accompanies him on the tracks of his childhood, which was characterized by the togetherness of Jews and Arabs. All my childhood was here in Jaffa. When I was a child, we used to play with Arabs, Jewish, no issue, wasn't any issue. We didn't know about uh, to hate something, to hate something people, you know, Arabs, Jews. It was different at the time. It was a beautiful world for a child who could dream anything. First of all, Jaffa is on the sea. It means something. People who go up on the sea, near the sea, they are smiling like me, you see all this. <laughs> and uh, the food is uh, amazing, wonderful. Um, the Arab food is amazing here. Fresh, we are talking about fresh food. I'm talking about, bef about food because this is, uh, this is my life, food. <laughs> Chaim Cohen is a popular TV star in Israel. As a judge of the cooking show MasterChef, he helped to make Tom famous too. Despite all his fame, the MasterChef is still down to earth. Jaffa, it's uh, authentic for me. It's like my mother's kitchen, uh, the, the roots is here. Uh, and it's still authentic. This is what's nice here. Tel Aviv. It's another country. I'm your beauty, you're my beast. Welcome to the Middle East. Tel Aviv, ya habibi, Tel Aviv. In Tel Aviv, life in the here and now dictates the rhythm of the city. The metropolis is thought to be the most modern and most laid-back city in the Middle East. The average age is 34. Heim Cohen's restaurant is right in the center. It's an institution of good taste. What's it called? Yafo, of course. Chaim, you're sort of the father of the chefs of Israel. There are almost no big chefs that, you know, are today of the leading uh, chefs in Israel that did not pass your restaurants. What did they take from you? If you want to teach them, you don't to teach them how to make salads. You teach them to think about the salad. What salad? means. I tell them that they must think about the subject in salad. Some, some, somebody here is leading in this salad and all the rest of the vegetables, they are serving the subject. If the tomato is subject, so the cucumber, the chili, the onion, they are serving them. Okay? So this is very important to teach them how to think and how to think about food. This is my, my uh, gift for them. Chaim Cohen if he didn't use his creation to give Tom a puzzle to solve. The dish the chef took out of his taboon oven, which is 400 degrees hot, looks like roast lamb. But there's dynamite behind it. The 
master has come up with something. A dish which symbolizes the Middle East conflict. Wow. That looks amazing. If you want to make peace, you have to eat the same plate by hands. I was this thinking about how to eat it. I think it's... This is Middle East. This it's is not Europa. Food. Okay, it's not Europe. Cheers. Lechaim. You take the pita bread, take some piece of meat, vegetables. Some, meat. some vegetables and... Mm. 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 It's so good. Mm. This is Israel. This is Jewish. This is Arab. It's hot. It's spicy. It's a lemon. It's fat. It's tasty. It's crazy. This is the conflict. <laughs> and there's a solution when you bring it into balance? This is the, this is the solution, you're right. <laughs> okay, this is the solution. It's so great. The conflict on a plate. Running a restaurant in Tel Aviv also means living with the threat of war. Is this the key to the attitude to life in the city? When we have the Gaza war, the restaurant was full when we heard the, the alarm about masses that are coming from Gaza here to Tel Aviv. Everyone goes out, watch the rockets, and we came back to eat. I think we are living the moment. We don't believe really in future. We believe, we want to believe in future. We are talking about future and blah, 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 but really, how we are living? We are living the moment somewhere we have fear that one day and maybe tomorrow it will finish. <laughs> B'nai Brak. Some 180,000 ultra-Orthodox Jews live in this suburb of Tel Aviv. The devout appreciate Tom Franz because as master chef, he raised kosher cuisine to a gourmet level. While Tel Aviv celebrates life, in this area, religion is at the center of everything, as it was hundreds of years ago. In the center, there's a 24-hour synagogue. It must be the most lively synagogue in the whole of Israel. They pray 24-7 here all the time. And you know that when you get here, you will always find a minyan, the quorum of 10 men required to make a prayer. There is always, always something going on. You can pray around the clock here. It's a true institution of B'nai Brak. The culinary institution of B'nai Brak is Hillel's restaurant. They say that he makes the best Shabbat dishes in town. Devout Jews are not allowed to work on Saturday or use electricity. But they want to eat well on Shabbat. Hillel has turned this dilemma into a business. He makes kosher Shabbat dishes to go, which can be kept warm at home. Hillel, the people are standing in a queue to, you know, to get your food. What are the special dishes you are you're offering here? The special thing we have over here in the store is chunant. We have kegel potatoes and kegel noodles mm -hmm. and noodles this is especially what we have no this is called chunt this one because in the jewish you have saturday you can't cook nothing you're not allowed to cook now you have to make something warm for the for saturday in the morning it should be something warm you should eat something mm. This must be the best cholent I've ever eaten. It's a dish which is prepared on Friday afternoon. Ingredients like beans, pearl barley, meat and potatoes in a big pot. This stew will be kept warm in the oven on low heat until Shabbat. So it's a dish which is cooked for 18 or 20 hours on low heat. And you take it out on Shabbat, and eat it together. The Shabbat begins on Friday at sunset and ends on Saturday after sunset. This island of time is sacred to devout Jews. The whole week we work, 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 you know, not stopping working. <laughs> the Shabbos, you know, you have to stop everything. 
no no work, no lights. That's why I have time. We sit all everybody by the table. Everybody we make uh, we sit down. All all the grandchildren, the children. Everybody come come to the fathers, to the mothers, and, and we sing. Can, uh, you know, we make we make a day in a, a day in a week happy. <laughs> Should be happy. <laughs> Hillel emigrated to Israel from Brooklyn. But why don't Orthodox Jews live in Tel Aviv? It's a Jewish place. Everybody is Jewish. You, know, you have all, all synagogue, you have for the children to go to, to, to learn, you know, that mean a school in English. And that's what, you know, that's why everybody wants to have the, the children and should go the same thing as, as the father was, as the father and mother was. And if you go to Tel Aviv today, Tel Aviv is not so, it's also Jewish, but there's not, the, the, it's not so, so, so long, long, long over here. We want to follow our religion. That's why we came to the neighborhood. For many devout Jews, secular Tel Aviv is a hotbed of sin. On popular Rothschild Boulevard, we meet Meir Adoni, a creative genius of the gourmet metropolis. Culinarily speaking, he's the counterpart of B'nai Brak. <laughs> In his top restaurant, Katit, and the casual branch of Mislala, Adoni creates dishes which are influenced by the Moroccan traditions of his ancestors. Is this the doorway to the new Israeli cuisine? What is the taste of Tel Aviv? What is it that makes the city's atmosphere so special? Tel Aviv is one of the best cities to live because it's, it is a really 24 hours a city. You can find everything here, you know, if seriously you have like a, a gay club, we have 24 hours restaurant that's serving you food, even, even 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the morning. And I think the people, the people here are really, they are like fun people, you know, we are full with emotion, we love to live, we love, we love the world, we love to, 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 we are hugging the people that are coming to Israel, we really appreciate that and we, I think we have a lot to give. I cannot dream that I was doing something else in my life, you know. Since I'm a kid, I was sure I'm going to be a chef. And I'm sure the influence of my mother and my grandmother, that's a big part of this decision. Couscous. What's important to Adoni are the memories he has in connection with the taste. At home, he's cooking his kosher. But in his restaurant, he breaks all the rules of Jewish dietary laws. This is one of my four restaurants, and, but this is my heart. This is my truly heart. This restaurant represents the high level, the fine dining of the new Israeli, modern Israeli cuisine. This restaurant is non-kosher restaurant. You know, my mother is not happy with that. But, but that's, in this restaurant, we are cooking also shellfish and, and uh, mixed dairy and meat, what we are not allowed in the Jewish uh, Bible and rules. But in this restaurant, I'm like the bad Jewish boy. I'm going to do that. And here we have like a confit of uh, mussels. And we start to play with that. We start to build like an ocean beach. You can play with that also. Take. Make fun. And we have like here the uh, basil, fresh basil flowers. In B'nai Brak, this creation would be pure sin. Mussels aren't kosher, nor is the ink of squids. Okay, now we take the fish, you go out from the oven, we put it in the middle. It's a real signature dish which catapults tradition into the present. This is where Adoni sees the future. Five years from now, I think the next wow in the culinary in the world is going to be the Israeli cuisine. That's, that's a cuisine that has so much to give, and I think around the world, there is only few people that really know this cuisine. 
and it's really it's full with emotion and it's really full with colors that's what makes it special and i think that's the next thing that will as regards international standing the architecture of the white city is far ahead of israeli cuisine it was built by Jewish Bauhaus architects who fled to Israel following the rise to power of the Nazis. The attempt to found a new egalitarian society is also reflected in the city's architecture. It's without frills. It's the conscious renunciation of representative symbols. Roof terraces as meeting places. Form follows function. Katit is another listed Bauhaus building. Okay, Tel Aviv, you know, it's also known as the White City because the Bauhaus buildings. Um, that I think the designer came from uh, Germany, no? Like almost like 70 years ago, or even more, like 80 or 90 years ago. And the 30s, 40s were exactly the time when Tel Aviv was exploding. And the Bauhaus architects built the whole city in very short time and since 2003 Tel Aviv is also a UNESCO World Heritage because of this biggest Bauhaus project in the world. Okay you know until today even like the city hall keeping the rules of preserving this building you know you have to build when you take a place like that to make it a restaurant you have to walk by the rules very sharp rules you cannot do other things you know you get like a huge fee if you walk different Some of Tel Aviv's districts are not mentioned in any of the travel guides. At the old bus station in the south of the city, Tom meets Gil Hovav, who comes from one of the most respected families in Israel. Gil is a culinary trendsetter and has discovered cultural wealth in the poorest district of Tel Aviv. This is the poorest street with the poorest uh, community in Tel Aviv, and it's the mecca of the foreign workers in Tel Aviv. So you see faces and figures and costumes that you would never meet. You see restaurants that you would never see in Israel. Sometimes, being a restaurant critic, I come here to try restaurants and foods that you would never meet in Israel, like yeah, Ethiopian food, Eritrean food, African food. Most of the times it's illegal. They don't get a work permit in Israel, they don't get a business permit in Israel, so you know, once you find it, once you don't, it disappears, etc. Actually, just in order to show you that African food is not the food of poverty, but it's a food, a cuisine of abundance, and a colorful cuisine, and a rich, healthy cuisine, I want to take you to one of my favorite spots in Tel Aviv. It's called Tenat. It's an Ethiopian restaurant, not of foreign workers. It's a the loveliest guy in Tel Aviv, an Israeli-Ethiopian guy, and I think you'll be amazed. Gil Hovav is the great-grandson of Eliezer ben Yehuda, the famous pioneer in the revival of spoken Hebrew. The roots of his family tell the history of the Jews. I have a Yemenite side to me, which is quite close to Ethiopian. This is why this food feels like home to me. But from the other side, I'm a quarter Moroccan and a quarter Belarusian. And my great-grandfather from the Belarusian side, from the Ashkenazi side, from the European side, is Eliezer ben Yehuda, who revived Hebrew. So when up until a hundred years ago, Hebrew was a completely dead language, just like Latin. Nowadays, we're born in Hebrew, we grow up in Hebrew, we're educated in Hebrew. So, yeah, it's a great-grandfather that I'm very proud of. Isaac from Ethiopia is the darling of the growing vegan scene in Israel. His creations meet current nutrition trends. 
His Eastern African Ethiopian breakfast is called Kita Fit Fit. This dish I get like every morning to wake up and to see it on the table. It's like a beautiful morning. And who cooks at home? Do you cook or does somebody cook for you? No, mom cooks. Mom cooks. Mom cooks. <laughs> In the meaning of the name of the restaurant, Tenat, what does it mean? Oh. <laughs> I, I was trying to think about uh, which name I, was, I want to give to the place. And I said, uh, Tena is mean health, and uh, Nat is mean mom. So I said, okay, let's combine them to Tenat. <laughs> and, so, and it became to be health of mom. A very good combination. And right? like, it's uh, health of like, my mom, your mom, your mom, or it can be like mom, planet Earth, health of planet Earth, so it's combined to the vegan restaurant. Fresh bread, and roasted in sunflower tahina, served with cold but spicy tomato sauce. A vegan power breakfast, Ethiopian style. And she makes it every morning for you when she when gets up? When children, every morning. This is the breakfast with a hot cup of tea. And it's amazing. My friend Itzik, <laughs> she loves you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and rightly so. <laughs> Tel Aviv feels a lot bigger than 400,000 urban inhabitants. This is also thanks to its diverse nightlife. The city where allegedly the party never ends is getting ready to go out. In an old hall on the outskirts of the city, preparations for a very special night have begun. The most unconventional of Israel's star chefs opens the doors of his temple on two nights a week only. Ail Shani doesn't just make food. What I'm doing, I'm making an order, like hypnosis of the ingredients. I'm putting them in the right place. I try to find the only one right place that they have to be. You know, these ingredients got away. They are like human beings, like animals. It's not um, something. It's somebody. So I got a will and a wish where to be. While the master mentally prepares for the night on the outskirts of the city, Tom is taste testing Shani's popular street food restaurant in the center. There's cauliflower served as finger food on their menu, as well as lamb shawarma with spring onions. Shani is the philosopher among the star chefs. Tomatoes are not just tomatoes to him. He talks to them and has a very special relationship with his produce. What relation? It's, um, it's the reason why I'm living. If I succeed, so I feel like son of the God. If I fail, so... I don't know why I was born. Shani doesn't just entertain his exclusive guests with his big ego, he has also revolutionized fast food in Tel Aviv. His pitas are filled with crispy fresh vegetables or fillet steaks. It's haute cuisine for everyone. Here at Miznan you get gourmet food in your pitta. Pitta is a bread which works like a pocket and you don't need a plate. It's street food at the highest level. It's Ayel Shani, fantastic. In the end, I think that the Israeli cuisine is not a Mediterranean cuisine. 
it's not a French cuisine or the mixture between the French, the American, the Moroccan, and the Yemen. No, the Israeli cuisine is to take a sushi, to import the idea of the sushi, to put schnitzel inside the, the sushi, to cut it and to serve it as a sushi. That is the Israelis. They are collectors. And they are making unbelievable mixtures between religion, characters, ingredients, cultures. Israel seems ready for award-winning cuisine. It's not just a melting pot, but a country where you can clearly taste the cultural idiosyncrasies. The thing that unites the Israelis is their habit of eating and partying simultaneously. Eil Shani's restaurant, Has Salon, is the hippest insider's tip of the year for this. Food becomes a performance. Of course it's a celebration because it's coming till death. You will not live anymore after that service. And there's a lot of passion here. Also, the people that are coming, a lot of beautiful girls, a lot of very dangerous men. So it's a big excitement. Dancing on a volcano. It's another way for the Israelis to celebrate their identity. The Israelis, they don't want to look at the past. They cannot see the future. There's a big present in the Israeli people. And I think that the Israeli cuisine is talking about the present time. Like there will be no tomorrow and there was no yesterday. <laughs> 